Welcome, United States. Uh, okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to round six of the Asian School for Game Championship 2015. On government side, we have Ateneo two, Luigi going first, Josh going second, Trez going third. On opposition, we have Gamma Sarajaya one, Atira going first, Luke going second, and Kim going third. Uh, on the motion, this house welcomes. American military presence in the South China Sea. I'd like to invite the Prime Minister Luigi to speak on the motion of science in this game. Here you go. Ladies and gentlemen, there are three points of context I'm going to establish in this debate for it to be clear. There are three points of context. Number one. The first and foremost pillar of the ASEAN in the pillars that it's made when it was made is to promote peace, stability, and safety within its region. Not only is sovereignty important for the ASEAN as a value, but we believe they care about how states are able to operate and how states are able to do it and foster economic progress. Number two, China is a country that is constantly posed as a threat in the South China Sea to many Southeast Asian countries. We put in examples such as putting in reclamation or reclamation of the lands in these areas or sending in warships to counter against fishing boats in these places or even setting up last week an airstrip in the Spratly Islands and constantly trying to threaten against other nations that they will claim this land as much as possible. Even recently, they even stopped trade routes such as the $5 trillion ship that keeps on passing through the South China Sea, through the Malacca Strait and all of the Pacific Oceans. Thirdly, the United States, in, by 2020, is going to send in ships to the Senkaku Islands and the Spratly Islands for the purposes, and this is important, for the purposes of serving as a mediator in negotiations and as a mediator to promote stability in the area, to make sure that there's no, good, there's no active threat and to represent other countries in the region as well. That's why we believe that our stance is simple, that it is important for U.S. military presence in the South China Sea to be present in line with the values of the ASEAN. The two standards of this debate are simple for it to be judged upon. Number one, is this in line with the values of the ASEAN? And secondly, will it be effective in deterring China? I have two points of argumentation, no thank you. Firstly, and how the tension in the South China Sea goes against the values of the ASEAN, and how secondly, how now the need for military presence specifically is important in promoting stability. To the first one, and how the tension in the South China Sea goes against the values of the ASEAN. We believe in general, as I said earlier, the ASEAN should start it out with the fundamental pillars to promote peace, stability, and harmony in fostering economic progress, that states can operate on their own, that sovereignty is an important value for the ASEAN because all of its treaties are reliant upon states being able to operate properly without any active threat and for them to be represented equally and made sure to do whatever they can to promote economic progress. We believe, therefore, that the tensions in the South China Sea harm that type of peace because of the following reasons. Number one, because there is an active threat of South of the China, of the of the country of China, for them to continuously send in boats and ships, and even in negotiations to continuously threaten against countries, like they said recently, that they will never allow their ancestors to be forgotten, and that they will make sure that this goes on as much as possible. That they continue with reclamation, that they continue threatening fishing boats in the region, stopping the lives of other fishermen and other people that try and live in, in that region. Secondly, even right now, even without the South China Sea, there are other ways that they still continue that tension. Like, for example, trade embargoes effectively make other nations even poorer because of this conflict specifically. That because China has no one retaliating against them other than the fact that negotiations continue to happen, China can continue their trade embargoes against other countries. Like, for example, their trade embargoes against Vietnam and their rice continuously make Vietnam even poorer. Or even in the Philippines, that even in places like Mindanao, the banana industry and the farmers in this area 
continuously do not get accepted in China. That continuously, people are getting poorer. That states, because of this conflict, are suffering without any course of regard and any success in negotiations to make sure that it can happen. But thirdly, even in these other areas, the South China Sea on its own, with the presence of even these Chinese ships being in the area continuously det deters other investors from going into the area and continuously and promoting economic progress. We put the examples such as Vietnamese investors that try as much as possible to gain uh, gain shares in the oil companies in the area or to continuously be forced to not go to these places and to even reach the sea routes of going to other countries in these places, right? In general, therefore, all these reasons prove to you that all alternatives have failed because we'd like to point out that negotiations are happening. It is true, but they're unsuccessful for the simple reason that if China can continuously do all of these actions without any type of sanction, without any type of threat to actively go against it, then we believe that this is harmful for the economic progress of these other states in the region. And that's why it's important for the ASEAN to take an intervention and to make sure that they can welcome these U.S. US ships into the places by 2020. The conclusionist argument is therefore simple. These people need to be represented by a higher body like the United States for them to have negotiating powers for it to be stronger and for us to counter those negotiations. Yes. Do you actually think the USA is being so altruistic using their taxpayers' money to help out in the conflict? Or do you think they have other vested? Yes, because the United States has an interest for themselves to make sure that their economic progress or the ties that they have with the ASEAN is going to be even stronger. That's why the Philippines and the United States have really strong relations in terms of their in terms of their economies and the things that we have by promoting investors within both regions. These things are always present. Secondly, why is it important that military presence is the only solution that we have to promoting stability? We believe that military presence is important for the simple reason because these give negotiating power to weaker nations because they themselves can't negotiate. But moreover, it promotes stability in the region for the simple fact that if you're able to send in more ships in the region and then you have other Chinese ships in there, we believe it's easier that they're going to be deterred for that to do that. That you have a third party actor and a mediator in negotiations for them to be represented by the ASEAN and the United States in these places for to do that. No, thank you. How does stability then happen? Because we believe that China, and this is the way we want to characterize China, China is a state that reacts to incentives. It reacts to threats and is going to be, like to an extent, a rational actor that, re that reacts to the, all different situations that are posed towards them. That's why recently it's, but it was easier for the United States to threaten the, in the Sekaku Islands to protect Japan, who was a demilitarized nation, from, from the air, the, the air defense identification zone that was made by China recently because China recently, uh, recently lessened the strictness of that policy within this place. We believe that if you have physical threats, such as ships in these places, wherein China is incredibly weak at, we believe that's a solution that we want to have. So just for example, the United States has continental lift for them to be able to have different areas within the region and bases for them to be promoting all their military efforts in protecting them in terms of stability. Or moreover, even statistically, the United States has 20 warships while China only has six. And even in these other places, having many allies to go against one big China is much more better in terms of negotiation, is much more better in terms of giving an active threat to all these different things. Ladies and gentlemen, for the reasons of the fact that we believe that the United States and ASEAN must cooperate in being, bringing stability and peace within the region that is incredibly full of conflict, we believe that you have to side with government. I'm very proud to oppose. Yeah. Thank you, Prime Minister, for that speech. To open the debate on the negative bench, I'd like to invite uh, Atira, the leader of opposition, to give us yeah. a Second. 
The ownership of the Spratly Islands is undetermined and undecided. However, we think the presence of the U.S. military only aggravates the situation of who owns it and does more harm than good. We agree that the ownership is disputed and we agree that the United States is here, sure. However, we think that ASEAN, however, we disagree on the point that ASEAN should welcome it for several reasons. I have three extensions for you coming from my speech. First, why the U.S. presence should not be here to begin with. Second, why the U.S. will make things worse for countries within ASEAN dealing with the spread of the islands. And third, on how a, how a conflict resolution is benchmarked upon the strength of your military under your side, how that's something that we abhor. What's the stance coming from side opposition? It's simple. We think that the U.S. military presence proves more harm than good, and we think that it's also our, work, uh, our burden within our side, right? And we, uh, as well as that ASEAN should not welcome the U.S. military. Before I move on, several levels of rebuttals, right? The leader of op the, the prime minister told us this, right? He told us he a very good job of how bad China is, right? But he never really proved to us how the U.S. would better the situation, how the U.S., any concrete proof yeah. of how the U.S. would actually make the situation better, right? We think that's a great problem coming from his speech, seeing that as how, as how that's their burden to begin with. But the second thing he told us was that it's a last case scenario that we should always try other things and other things have failed. The only thing he considered was negotiations before conflict. And it's conflict is the worst possible thing that could happen, right? We think before conflict, we'd rather take other actions, things like sanctions, things like no free trade from uh, from us and China we are, are no longer having those kind of negotiations, right? We think these are the kind of things that we can threaten China with before we resort to conflict. And we can think that these are things are very well done by ASEAN to begin with, right? The third thing he told us about, is, uh, if the third thing that I'd like to clarify is that it's not our burden to regulate China in this instance, right? Our burden is to prove that the US military presence does more harm than good. What was the th uh, this, uh, third thing that he told us? right that the u.s has a vested interest in protecting ASEAN, right? We don't think that's necessarily true because if you're talking about an economic sense, right? China is the biggest market in the world, right? As a comparison to ASEAN, we think the U.S. is much better off trying to protect China in this case, right? Also on a comparison, if you want to compare about the U.S. not being profit incentivized at all, we don't think that's true because if you compare like oil and the amount of hydrocarbon oil that actually exists within the Spratly Islands and you compare that to the meager ASEAN audience that they're actually catering for, there's a very high chance that the U.S. would side not in favor of ASEAN to begin with. With. Well, the fourth thing they told us, right, that China reacts to incentive. We'll prove to you in my speech how that is an extreme harm coming from your side. Then they give us this example of Senkaku versus Spratly, right? We think that's not a fair comparison to draw because the Spratly Islands has a lot of hydrocarbon oil and that China will definitely defend the Spratly Islands because it's profit incentivized as well. And they told us this, that the U.S. has a lot of allies. Good. China also, uh, China also has a lot of allies. But let's look at my arguments coming for, uh, in today's speech, right? First, why the U.S. presence should not be here. The U.S. has proven time and time again in history that it is profit incentivized. We saw this in Iraq, where the Iraq war actually came and huge U.S. companies came and extracted oil in Iraq to begin with, right? We think that this happens because a lot of companies within the U.S. that are actually lobbying and promoting these kind of governments are companies that are vastly interested in the kind of manifesto that they have that includes like uh, intervention within other countries, right? We saw this happen during the Iraq war as well. That's why the state feels accountable to actually go through with these policies to begin with. We think it's extremely hard for the U.S. to break out of this dot quote that these companies hold on them to begin with, right? On well, the second level, we think what happens when we welcome the U.S. in the first place and they say in, your, in the worst case scenario, they actually do manage to take this all, they actually do manage to extract this all. We think they will, they will take a majority of this all that belongs to ASEAN in the first place, right? We think it's extremely harmful because the As because ASEAN needs the Spratly Islands because uh, the Spratly Islands are the cause of uh, the main like uh, is, is a really huge reserve on hydrocarbon and oil. It's a commercial fishing and and shipping area, and it's the fourth largest reserve bit in the world, right? We think these are things that ASEAN deserves to be able to bank upon and not the United States. We don't think uh, we think in this situation under your side the worst case scenario is that they don't get the resources and the, the situation is further aggravated. Let's look at the second extension that we have and why the U.S. will make things worse, right? We think that for one thing, the presence of the U.S. does not mean that it will just stop at the presence, right? We don't know how far this ceiling will necessarily go. We don't know how far it will go. And the fact that the U.S. is accountable to no one in the first place. Maybe you want to say the U.N., but even in the U.N., they have veto power to begin with, right? We saw the U.S. exploiting a lot of times, things like Afghanistan, things like Iraq, without any form of check and balance, right? We don't think you can prove to us that it will only stop and military presence. Let's say they go to that area and they have military presence or they have intervention. We don't think that the U.S. even counters for things like collateral damage in a lot of times, right? And even if they were to do collateral damage, they don't have any form of reparation for it. They don't build back their infrastructure, they can't pay back lives. We think the U.S. should stay away. But instead on ownership, right? The fact, the second level, that ownership in itself is disputed within the Spratly Islands. Sure, we can see that that happens. However, we think it's always disputed amongst ASEAN nations in itself. 
The only time when it's not is China, right? China's the only person who's disputing against this. We think even when China's doing that, there are a lot of check and balances that exist, right? Things like heavy scrutiny, things like international pressure. Point, I mean, but China in itself is already taking an incentive to regulate itself. It has diplomatic talks already, something you conceded to. We think that in fact, China already, that China being here in itself is already bad enough. But what's the one thing that ASEAN didn't do to China? They did not recognize the presence of Chinese military. They did not acknowledge the presence of Chinese military. We think when you acknowledge the presence of the US military, that's when you give them an incentive to actually be able to do whatever they want within the space, that's not something that we want. I think also you further aggravate the United States, right? Because the United States in itself has no accountability, it's not its veto power, and the UN has extreme military capability. You further distance the ownership of Spratly Islands further away from ASEAN nations, nations and the resources which belong to ASEAN state, the sovereign state of ASEAN, goes to two unaccountable forces. Go. Your international pressure and your sanctions can mean nothing. Because I already told you that these are weaker nations without a higher body to represent them in these negotiations. Your negotiations will continuously fail no matter what. Can you please respond to that? The problem is your higher body now is also a puppet incentivized company. It's also a company with no accountability. It's also a company that will it's also a, a, a body that will fo that will do nothing if you have sanctions to it either. So even if you want to argue that, that's not mutually exclusive to your paradigm. On the third idea on how conflict resolution is be will become benchmarked on the strength of a military. Now we have diplomatic talks already. We're already having progress that's moving towards accepting and actually you know having facilitating good discussions in this instance right but then when the u.s comes in here with its huge military force with this huge advanced military force it cannot be contested by the asia by the asean countries right who are third world countries except maybe singapore but even then singapore is very in line with the united states to begin with right the, the claim becomes a, 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 a game of intimidation in this instance, right? Where the US military is so imposing and it's extremely hard for other ASEAN nations to come in and fight against the US, right? In conclusion to this first level, ASEAN can never win. They gave up the only chance of taking back Spidey Islands that they had from China, which was um, which which was diplomatic talks in the first place. But second, how you legitimize China to use military force in the first place? So China has, has made progression, right? They've done diplomatic methods with this. And even though it hasn't been resolved, efforts to avoid intense conflict has actually happened. In things like November 20, uh, 2002, a declaration on the conduct of parties in the South China Sea was signed, right? Things like they agreed to friendly consultation in exchange of like territorial disputes, right? So now what's going to happen? So now China has every right to say that, okay, US Navy ships are here, our Navy ships being here are legitimate too. We think China says, ASEAN, you didn't welcome us. We're not going to engage in free trade agreements. We're not going to negotiate. We think under your side, you breed conflict and you further uh, dis victimize ASEAN countries. Thank you for your opposition, Akira, for that speech. Now, to continue the debate on the affirmative branch, I'll invite Josh, the Prime Minister. The problem with the previous speaker is that she assumes that because of diplomatic relations that China is already engaging in, it means that eventually, maybe in the next 50 years, we'll be able to have some concessions from China. We think that's extremely problematic, given that the fact that already China thinks that it's the strongest body within the Pacific, meaning that its mentality is that we can continue to push countries like the Philippines, countries like Japan, who have a much weaker economic and military background, and that's why we can do things like this. This is extremely problematic given that the fact that they provide no alternative to the solution in which they defend status quo, which is inherently flawed to begin with. What am I going to argue later on? I'm going to argue later on about China's mentality, in which if you let it propagate and you continue to support status quo, we think even under your best case scenario, China will receive only very minimal punishments. China will only receive, but at most, they're going to get so much concessions that they're going to con keep continuing this in the near future. But before I move on, let's move on to a couple of rebuttals. The first thing we're going to get coming from the previous speaker is this, that the United States shouldn't intervene because, you know, ASEAN will probably use the oil in Spratly's Islands because the United States, under their simplistic logic, is extremely profit-driven and eventually will take the oil instead of, give, instead of giving it to the ASEAN. First level of response. No, we think that this is inherently unlikely for the reason that the United States has literally no claim to the Spratly Islands or the Kasenkaku Islands in the very first place. But moreover, why are they even incentivized to do this in the first place? They tell us that they're likely to side with China, but that's not really the thing. Why? Because we think that when it comes to the United States and its trade relations, it has more trade relations compared to China. In fact, the United States and its companies have already been necessarily pulling out investments and work and factories there and moving into cheaper areas such as Bangladesh, meaning China already doesn't have a, a, 
a monopoly on cheap labor if that's what they're trying to argue in the very first place. Please sit down. But next, they argue as if, that, for example, that fighting will happen and now con the conflict will ensue. Because they tell us, because now there are U.S. military forces there, now we will legitimize Chinese warships in our, in our seas and whatnot. Firstly, we think that China is not really stupid and we think that they can act rationally, meaning they never won't necessarily win a fight that you can't win. Comparatively, we think that when you have the strongest navy on the universe, in the earth there in the Pacific Ocean, we think that what happens is that it is actually the turn for them to actually send boats to Spratlys, to actually send boats everywhere and whatnot. But lastly, she gives us this idea that there are already other alternatives, such as maybe not negotiations, but sanctions, embargoes by the ASEAN community. And that's going to work, right? Firstly, we think that when it comes to sanctions and embargoes from countries like the Philippines, countries like Vietnam, we think that's not going to scare the, it's not, that's not going to scare China. Why? Because firstly, I don't think that Philippines and Vietnam would probably want to embargo or not trade with China since it's, that's extremely important for them in terms of trade relations. Mm -hmm. However, they're not going to be scared of losing maybe a few million dollars and whatnot coming from exports from the Philippines or Vietnam for that matter, meaning that in itself has no teeth and that in itself won't incentivize China to back off from their claim. But lastly, if she talks about diplomatic efforts and how it's already working, that China's not doing anything anymore, and then how come she can't explain the, the pictures that emerged a few days ago of that airstrip, Chinese airstrip being built in the Sprat East Island? We think that even if because of this, because how, because of because we've got we've let them get away with so many things for so long if you have a mentality of pushing people around and whatnot but before i continue yes we think that diplomatic relations are better on our side if the Philippines or Vietnam have a mediator for them and not, they're not going to be scared of the powerful might of the Chinese army that constantly threatens them day to day. What am I going to argue? Look, if you look at how we've been dealing with China in, the pa in their past aggressions, we at the very least, or, or at the very most at least, we tell you that the only thing that we have done in the past is that we've firmly told them that they're to back off, that we firmly told them that what they're doing is wrong. Even in the UN, we've told them that what they're doing is wrong and what their claims are inherently wrong. However, we have never sanctioned them. We have never done things to actually hurt China to make them back off to begin with. In fact, a few days ago, pictures already circulated of Chinese building an airstrip and whatnot. What does this necessarily mean? The reason why China keeps doing what it is doing right now is because of a few reasons. Firstly, China has acted very aggressively in the past few years, often only getting a slap on the wrist. No one has taken any active con and concrete method to tell them that they're wrong, to actively threaten them, to actively harm them, for them to back off, to actually for them not to do any grave grievous harm to individuals. But lastly, secondly, moreover, negotiations will and have failed. Because within the Pacific, China is and knows that it is the most powerful body in terms of political, political, military, and economic might. Meaning even in their best case scenario, one, that even if they keep arguing about status quo, and even if we consider their best case scenario, what's going to happen? At best, in terms of your negotiations, what will happen is, is that one, China is likely to get the big part. For example, you have a negotiations for splitting the Spratlys. China is likely to get half or a big portion of the Spratlys, while the rest of the ASEAN nations will get the short end of the stick. What does this entirely mean? This means that what you do is that you allow China to get away with so many concessions. You get the, let them get away with so many things without necessarily telling them what they're doing is wrong, thus reinforcing their mentality that we can continue to push other nations around and whatnot. So what? It is harmful, to, it is harmful in the end of the day because of two reasons. Simply, one, ASEAN nations are going to get the short end of the stick, even under their best case scenario, which we think is more likely to happen. But two, it becomes it becomes more likely for China to continue such actions in the long run because it knows that no one will go against them, because it knows that no one can actively threaten them and whatnot. How does our side solve this? We tell you that when you put there the brunt of the US Navy within Southeast, within the South China Sea. We think that we're actively telling them to back off and we're actively telling them that we are willing to act, that we are willing to retaliate if you do something stupid, if you do something grievous such as invade our land or build more airstrips and whatnot. We think that that's the problem in today's debate because they have to yet prove to us that status quo is enough. They have yet to prove to us that even if there is going to 
we have yet to prove to us that the harms that we that they've presented outweigh the benefits that we have presented on our side. We think that on our side, we think that what happens is that one, we deter China from actually doing things, not just in short term, but also in the long run, because we're telling them that they can't keep acting this way, because we tell them that they can't keep pushing around other people or other states and whatnot. And because of all these reasons and more, we are extremely proud to oppose. Yeah. oppose. Okay. I think John, that speech. Debate on the opposition bench, as by Luke, definitely the opposition. ASEAN stands with the pillars of things like peace and stability. And under their side, what their solution is, is to make sure that this place that is already under conflict even more conflicted. Where this place that is already so unstable, even more unstable. Mr. Speaker, we think if ASEAN wants to come, like, stay with his pillars of principles, we think that they should always resort to diplomatic means as a whole. Therefore, Prime Minister saying all this stuff about we should follow those three pillars argue, is against himself because they are the side who are arguing for military interventions, who are arguing for more and more fights between the, like, the two biggest armies in the whole world. We don't understand their case. I'm going to discuss two things. Number one, ASEAN, how did this affect ASEAN? And number two, would this aggravate the situation? But before that, a few points of rebuttals. Firstly, they characterized the whole problem to you in their speech, saying that the tensions of the China Sea are against the values of ASEAN and trade embargoes are being done and things like that. And it deters people from coming in. However, their solution is even worse because when more and more people start fighting in that particular area, we think that the harms that you guys are saying are exacerbated. Why? Because number one, more and more trade embargoes will be done by China. Because now they see ASEAN as people who are directly going against them by allowing the US to come in, meaning that more and more trade embargoes will be done to other ASEAN countries as well. Because not only will it be done to Vietnam and Philippines, it will be done to other countries because these other countries are also a part of ASEAN. Secondly, we think that when the US and, and the China fight, we think that that's even worse, right? Because in that particular area, there's an FDI and more and more people will be deterred from coming in because the conflict is even worse from the situation back then. So we think that under our side, we acknowledge that there are problems in society today. But the solution that you, they are proposing will make the problems even worse. Because now, you, legit, you uh, exacerbate the problems that's happening now, you aggravate the situation even more. But if ASEAN is supposed to stand on the pillars of peace and stability, your side doesn't follow that. ASEAN should be the ones who are trying to propagate peace and stability, not ask other people to fight their wars for them so that the peace wouldn't even come, except it would be even more aggravated. Sit down. Then they say that the military presence is the only thing that can work. Because, and then after that, they said and characterize China using its own words. We would like to characterize China as people who are open to pressure and things like that. The problem is that, is that number one, uh, first of all, they characterize that, that the US is coming into that place because the people of ASEAN, the trade things that they have, is extremely important, meaning that the things that ASEAN has is valuable towards China. So if any, if in any case, we all sanction China, or if any case, we do something with China, and they're so susceptible to pressure, we think sooner or later, they'll do diplomatic talks, which they're already doing in status quo, Mr. Speaker. And we think that even if in our worst case scenario, China wins a lot of the spreading islands over ASEAN, we think on the long-term comparison, at least ASEAN gets some ownership over spreading islands. At least we can resolve the conflict faster so that more and more FDI wouldn't be deterred out. So that more and more trade embargoes would stop in status quo already. Sit down. Thirdly, they say that the US will definitely win. We have a problem with this because number one, let's compare. China has its most interest in this particular place because they think they have ownership over the land. The US, however, as they can say, that they don't really have ownership over this land, meaning that China has more interest to send more troops towards this particular area than the US. But also, the South China Sea is like very near China. Uh, the US is like at the opposite end of the globe, meaning that it costs even more to send a lot of troops. And also, it's not their vested interest. They don't own that particular place, meaning that all the taxpayers and all the people and all the lobbies in the US wouldn't want to spend that much money on a place where they don't have ownership within that particular area. Sit down. Also, then they say that Philippines and all these places need a mediator for diplomatic talks to work. I don't understand. Why do you need to use military force as a mediator? You, if you want a mediator, ask the US who has a big economic presence to be the mediator of the place without actually using the military presence towards these people. What? Sit down. Last, respo last response. They say that conflict resolutions, in our best case scenario, the China will win a lot of the spread islands and things like that. Here's the thing. Firstly, we think that uh, Philippines historically, like 
first of all, we don't think that's necessarily true because Philippines and like all, all these places have more claims over these particular areas. Because Philippines can say that we were historically sovereign in these particular areas, while China can say, well, China doesn't really have all those claims. Meaning that when you have these diplomatic talks, the like the legitimacy for Philippines to claim more and ASEAN people to claim more over these particular spreadly islands is better. Secondly, we think that assuming that's true, we think that that's better than status quo right now. Because if ASEAN is striving for economy, for, uh, for economy, at least now they have, number one, some parts of Spratly Islands where they can extract the oil in that places. Number two, at least the FDI that is dictated in status quo can go and can come in. And number three, that the trade embargoes that they are suffering so much from, at least they get a reciprocal uh, benefits from China because the trade embargoes will be lifted after, this, after these particular resolutions. So on the comparative, even in our worst case scenario, at least ASEAN will strive better economically. Because under your side, your side characterized that the economy is so bad because of this, uh, because of the presence of China, at least we stop the presence of China in this particular place. Yes. You're misrepresenting our policy because this isn't a full-scale military intervention, yes. but the use of defense. They built ports in Vietnam and the Philippines yes. to accommodate U.S. naval ships over time so that they can be nearby when in continental left to fight. Okay, number one. Firstly, if you're not doing a full mil full scale military attack, then all your comparatives is weird because US isn't going to send 20 ships to battle the six China ships. They're going to send like five or four or things like that, right? But here's the thing, right? Even like the act of militarizing, even if the US says it's self defense, also China can say it's self defense because they see the US coming in with millions and millions, okay, with like a lot of people and more, some battleships there, meaning that the US, that the China will also feel as if that they are being threatened. Therefore, they can attack people and say that, oh, we thought it was the US attacking us. It was a preemptive strike. They can use the toys and things like this, which is even more harmful, right? You legitimize all the things that China does, which is what Atira said that they didn't really respond to. So, firstly, on ASEAN, how do you affect these people economically? Because number one, at least now people like at least under your side, when the when and when your side happens and the and the fight is a lot more exacerbated, number one, the trade embargoes will continue to carry on and you deter FDI to come in. We think that's harmful. And secondly, we think on, on the spreadly islands, they wouldn't get ownership in the end. We said already that the US wants to have to take most of the oil there. You then they say no, they're being like they're, they have a vested interest in trade and things like that. But here's the thing, right? If US doesn't have ownership in that place, now when they help resolute the conflict, they can say it as we helped you, now you help us back and give us some oil or things like that. Meaning that they have legitimacy to come towards ASEAN and say, look, we helped you resolve your conflict that you couldn't do it, give us some oil. But what being nice, right? Look, like US doesn't have ownership over Afghanistan. They have uh, ownership over Iraq. They still came in. They said, we resolve your problems and therefore we're going to extract all your oil. You need to deal with that. But lastly, would this aggravate the situation? We think that the increase in warfare itself means that China will feel threatened. They will, um, more, they will spend even more money on military to fight and combat China. Here's the thing, right? Number one, they'll increase its warships. They'll increase its paranoia, meaning that they'll attack even more ships and they'll build even more bases. Your side has a problem with China doing all these things. Your side aggravates them because now it's the paranoia that China has towards the US that will make them that will make China even more worse, right? They'll try to uh, like build up their defenses as well because they themselves are very stubborn. We don't like them, but in the end, you'll make them even you make them even more likely to be hated by me because they're going to be more Thank you. <laughs> Look for that speech now to conclude the substantive part of the government's case. I'd like to invite the government to give the As the government whip, I'm going to tackle two very important issues in this debate. Firstly, how is the presence of the U.S. going to affect the territorial conflict and how is it going to affect different characters and how are people going to react? Second issue, how do we create better development in the ASEAN? How do we make sure that the Philippines and Vietnam and other countries can properly develop and properly get the stability which they want because that is the pillar of ASEAN? First issue, how is the presence of the U.S. going to affect territorial conflict in other countries? Because the very first thing the leader of opposition told us is that they said that the U.S. is going to tap into our oil and that's why they said that's why they want to send boats and that is their only issue and that is their only motivation which is that they want to get the oil and they want to get the profit. Well, two levels of response. First
Firstly, that is a very big misclash because we told you that the presence of the United States will act as a mediator and a third party arbitrator to ensure that negotiations properly happen. Because as what Luigi gave you, we already told you that in the context of this of, of the ASEAN, China is violating their terms of the negotiation by sending in boats in the territory. No, thank you. By sending in boats in the territory, by building bases and airstrips in the Spratly Islands themselves. That is a violation of the negotiation. We think that in order to stop that, we need an arbitra arbit arbitrator. And we tell you that that's, that is already something which we are doing in status quo. We are already doing that, that in Japan with China. We're also doing that in Vietnam. We are sending boats, but we are not attacking them. The presence of the boats has worked also. Because in the given of the fact of Yemen, when the U.S. sent their boats, Iran sent their boats back. And, you know, the U.S. didn't even do a thing. Secondly, if we even if we lose this deadlock, and it's true that the United States really are selfish and really do this for their profit, then we tell you what are we going to lose, right? Because the worst case scenario is that they're only going to do this in small investments. Why is this likely? Because Josiah already told you that the United States has no historical claim over these islands. So if they are going to dispute in these islands, it's going to be very unjustified. And they can't tell us that the Afghanistan example works because the Afghanistan example is completely different because the ASEAN is still is strong enough to negotiate for themselves. Uh, and negotiate for themselves against the United States, given all their all their ties and other things. But even then, we think that the harm is very minimal at the end of the day. Let's move on to the next characterization. China is going to invade and legitimize their boats and their bases. Two levels of responses. The big problem is that they already do this in status quo. Even on their side, that's true. And they already implode, and they already impose and we think that that's something that already exists on their side. Secondly, let's look at what happens if we have the military presence. Number one. Either China will step down, which is what we said, and we can have better negotiations. And we think that that's likely because China always reacts to the United States. Or number two, if we do not stop them and we do have an intervention, that's our worst case scenario, let's see what actually happens. Two things. Number one, that's not mutually exclusive. Their side still has to solve or still has to prove what are they going to do with the absolute worst case scenario that China does attack. Secondly, at least on our side, we have the United States to protect them. We have at least anti-ballistic missiles. But the thing is, we're not going to be the ones who attack first. That's the misclash on their part. So we tell you that even with their, pre so even if they, even if China does attack prematurely, like what the deputy leader of opposition says, we think that our side is still willing to protect them. Our side can still be capable enough to protect them. Their side has presented any alternative of that absolute worst case. They haven't responded to us. That is something which we think is incredibly important. So why do we win this issue? To sum it up, firstly. Because we told you that the United States, even if they are going to, you know, take their claim and tap into their oil, we tell you that they are still going to lose or they're still going to get a minimal, that is a minimal harm and we are still going to be the winners in the long run. And secondly, even if China does attack or even if China does react and invade us, we tell you that the United States is already there, their side has no alternative. No thanks. Let's move on to the second issue. How do we create better development in the ASEAN? First, you have to establish what is the need of these bases. Because they told us that China is already starting to negotiate the people with, with uh, ASEAN. And you know that's them already discounting the fact that we told you that last July 2, 2015, they just set up an airstrip in Spratly Islands and violated negotiation terms, all right? Two things. Firstly, or three things rather. Firstly, right, they never asked, or the problem with their side is that they never asked how do effective negotiations work in the first place. We told you that effective negotiations happen if we are going to, you know, if we have an equal platform where both people are equally represented. Why is that not the case in ASEAN? Because we already told you, coming from Luigi, that they already set up their bases. There is a giant imbalance of power in Asia because China is much, much larger, magnitudes larger than, you know, the, than ASEAN. It, like, Sending our sending military bases or sending the United States presence in itself is a benefit because even if their boats will still be kind of outnumbered by China, at least there is still a close chance that we are going to beat them. That is our worst case scenario. Secondly, they still have to assess if all of those negotiations really do work and outweigh all of the harms that have existed, like China attacking fishing boats and China setting up bases in the territories of different countries, which they are not supposed to, which is a violation of sovereignty, mind you. No thanks. Thirdly, Thirdly, even if, right, let's assume their negotiations work, there is no guarantee that China will follow these negotiations. China has a track record of betraying all the violations. Let's look at a case scenario. The United Nations said, you know, United the nations voted that China should not set up bases in, in, in their island or something like that. What did China, how did China react? China set up bases. So basically, we tell you that there is still a big chance that China is going to, you know, uh, violate their negotiation terms even after the negotiation has already applied. There is no accountability. No, thank you. There is no accountability. We think that our side can better bring that accountability. But let's move on to the next thing they told us. 
the United States presence, you know, the United the United States will pressure and steal oil, and that's bad for for and that will that will be bad for stealing resources. That analysis says that they do not like it when other countries or when big countries pressure small countries into uh, following their terms. Hmm. We think that that's the same thing that China is doing to the Philippines and the same thing that China is doing to Malaysia. But we think that if it comes down to it, if we have to ask ourselves, do we prefer the U.S. or pressure or do we prefer China pressure? We tell you we prefer the United States, you know, negotiating with us or, you know, coming to terms and taking our oil. Why is that? Because of two things. Firstly, the United States has a better track record of actually following negotiations. So we have a better chance. So at the worst case scenario that, China, that the United States does get oil from the Spratly's Island, at least a very big chance that we're still going to get the negotiation which we want and the terms which are properly you know, assessed. Uh, secondly, we, will, we are already allies with the United States and we have strong ties. We told you already that the United States has big ties with the Philippines and Malaysia and Japan. So we tell you that it is in their interest to give us good benefits and other things like that. So how do we improve the SAM? in two ways. Firstly, we give safety because we tell you that in order for negotiations to work, we have to remove China's mentality that they can do whatever they want because they are the biggest dog in the Asia, in Asia. And we tell you we can only do that if we have the United States sending in their boats because we'll tell you we do not tolerate what you're doing. We do not tolerate you sending your boats. Secondly, we let the Philippine boats pass. We prevent China from attacking the boats and making them afraid of even sending trade from, from one country to another. So why do we win this debate? Because of two things. Firstly, the whole debate, they've misclashed and assumed that we wanted war. But even if they, we had war, we are still going to be able to mitigate that. Secondly, all of the harms they gave us are also present on their side. But at least on our side, we have a much better attempt to solve that. We have a much better chance for change. I am very proud to propose. It's hilarious, if anything not, when there are three flaws of their case already existing. Firstly, is the idea when they said that, oh, we need US because we need them to facilitate the diplomatic talks that must exist within the claims of, Sp of Spratly Island. But then, technically, then you wouldn't actually need the military invasion as a whole. But secondly, it is also when they said that, oh, losing oil is a minimal loss that exists within this debate. We think that the reason why individual countries want to actually fight for the particular island is the existence of oil. But thirdly, is the idea when U.S. can do whatever they want, can take whatever they want, we have nothing to lose. Madam, Mr. Speaker, the idea of U.S. taking generally the resources that exist on that island is everything we have to lose. I'm going to look at this debate on four different issues, right? First, let's look at the biggest issue within today's debate. In terms of which is the military invasion, the best method of solving the particular issue. But secondly, is let's analyze the U.S. mentality. Thirdly, is whether or not they further, how they further legitimize the claim of which U.S. could somehow still claim the island in the long term run. But last but not least, how they further was in the situation on several levels. So firstly, is a military invasion the best scenario or the best method to do so? No, thank you, sir. Let's analyze this in the situation that existed. Why are countries so unwilling to give up their claim? Countries like Vietnam, countries like Philippines, multiple Asian countries are unwilling to give up their claim because of the ideology and the mentality that these countries have saying that I own some part of this island. That is a mentality that you cannot get rid of through military invasion. That mentality is something that has to be agreed upon and can only be agreed upon diplomatic talks. The form of diplomatic talks is when countries are willing to have the constructive discourse of which they want to tell individuals, give me a reason to why I cannot have my country. The form of this, this um, constructive discourse is the exact aim that we need to have through diplomatic talks because that's one of the only reasons we can actually generally have a, a discourse among which countries actually solve it and how we want to even try and take a stepping stone to try to solve the ownership problem. No, well, thank you, sir. On a comparison, because we agree that there's a problem, but let's analyze why the problem exists. It's a problem which is said, um, territorial and jurisdictional. We think these are problems that you cannot fix through military invasion because these are countries that don't give up the mentality, not because they lost the war, but because the ideology still remains and they will try and fight as much as they can. Considering so, the question then becomes, do we then still, do we then still think military invasion as the best method to do so? We tell you, 
not. Let's do a comparison within both sides in terms of how we want to solve the diplomatic, um, in terms of how we want to solve the situation on the ground. On a comparison, we think countries are generally more willing to opt into a, 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 a discussion of which is generally more diplomatic versus having to actually opt into military invasion as a whole. The willingness of countries to do so is exactly what we need to have for you to have constructive discourse, which is a necessity to even try and solve the problem. On a comparison, if you use military invasion and if you use methods which countries are not willing to opt into, then your side is a side that will never solve the issue. Your side is a side that is going to worsen the situation. If anything not, you you worsen it and you legitimize the acts of using military invasions as a whole. But before that, yes, sir. Your side already has the threat of China violating the terms of diplomacy. You haven't presented any alternative other than status quo, quo which obviously hasn't worked. What is your mechanism to prevent that harm then? Obviously, on our side, we understand that um, China has votes in that. But the reason to why we understand that China is still willing to have diplomatic talks is because they they have not shot they have not um shot out any weapons, nor have they actually made active action to causing harm within the island. In your side, it's a side that wants to bring U.S. military invasions. That is exactly when you legitimize the acts of China wanting to respond to the particular action as a whole. It's yes, you can see and see a multiple number of times that China has less with the U.S., but China will still fight. That is an inevitable fact of which China will still want to fight because they realize that this is an island which I own. The ideology is something that I want to fight for. It's extremely, extremely hard for you to get rid of the ideology. In conclusion that to my first issue, you can literally see on comparison of both methods, we obviously will take the diplomatic method over the military method. Secondly, let's analyze US mentality because they somehow still cannot understand why US still has the intention of wanting more than to help their situation as a whole. We give you multiple scenarios and even Athira's speech, we told you that Afghanistan, Iran, these are multiple situations of which the US have already failed when they intervene in doing so. You cannot brush it off and simply say it's okay. In this case, it's different. Analyze Afghanistan. Look at how much harm US have caused there and how it's irreversible harm the US have caused. And Afghanistan as a whole can never opt out of the situation they are in. We think these are factors you need to, you need to take into consideration before even allowing US to intervene. Considering so, are we willing to take that chance? Is there even a chance of, of um, ASEAN ever trying to solve the situation? We tell you yes. The idea of which individuals are still willing to have talks, right. diplomatic talks, when the willingness of countries to do so is something we think is significantly important. Thirdly, no thank you, sir. That leaves the idea when they further legitimize the claim and exactly they told you the problem that China already has boats. China already has weapons within that particular island as a whole. The second you allow a military invasion to enter, that's when you legitimize the acts. But let's do the second level of analysis on that motion. It's the idea when you legitimize the acts, it's exactly when you have to re realize after you legitimize the acts, there is no going back to having negotiations. There is no going back to having diplomatic talks when those fight, when those um, launch have actually been fired as a whole. We think these are extremely harmful towards the possible other methods of doing so. You eliminate any other method of doing so once you have actually allowed US to intervene. But last and not least, let's analyze the thirdly. How you further worsen the situation on several levels. But before that last one. We already conceded that the United States might be selfish. But we told you that we'd rather have a selfish United States than a selfish China. Because at least the former can keep its own promises. How will you tell to respond to We that? don't understand why you somehow think US will still want to fight for something and not get anything back. On a comparison, we think obviously in terms of um, ASEAN, there's a high likelihood of that island still going back to ASEAN. In US's case, do they have any accountability of giving back to any ASEAN country? Do they have any accountability or any deterrence to actually keep it for themselves? We don't think so. But also, and as analyzed, last but not least, how you further worsen the situation within status quo. We told you on governments already, when, when we told the government already told you that, chi that, that China has both, and this is one of the biggest argumentation, that's why I'm tackling it so much. Exactly now when the US intervenes, we usually want to add no comparison on before US intervenes and after US intervenes. The comparison is actually significant to what happens to that country, to what happens to the island as a whole, but to also what happens to every other country that wants to even fight for the island as a whole. When you force China to actually do these methods, other countries will also seem to realize if this is the only only way for me to gain my island back, or this is the only way for me to actually place my um place my place my personal opinion to what I need back. We think these are countries that will resort to the method as a whole on a worst case scenario. We think these are countries that are willing to fight for what they think they deserve, and this is exactly when you worsen the situation, assuming these countries actually take action into doing so. That's when the idea of our countries not having discourse or countries not having constructive discourse is exactly the worst. In conclusion, we think that it's clear within society right now, within a particular situation or the conflict that arises, we cannot let US intervene, nor can we welcome US into the situation that exists. We are supremely proud to oppose. Thank you, Kimberly, for that speech. That concludes the substantive half of the debate. Now, to move on to the reply speeches, uh, but to provide Luke, the Japanese leader of opposition to the opposition reply.
this debate has been going in circles because they characterize the problem and our case was telling you why your side exacerbates the problem. In the end, this debate will be decided on a few things. Number one, will their policy work? Because we think that from one end, they're saying that the military can easily overpower the China. And on the other hand, they suddenly shifted and said that, you know what, you know, uh, like just even if you're outnumbered, China, at least there's a presence there. Then suddenly they said that we won't even attack, meaning that their case is just a standstill between China and US. We never understood that. So therefore, let's analyze this. Will their policy work? We don't think so, because we already told you for many reasons why. Number one, China has geographical advantages, meaning that there's, like their bases are right there, whereas the US bases are a lot further away. We also say that China has more interest, meaning that they're more willing to spend more money on it based on the characterization that, say, that they say. Because they say US doesn't have ownership over it, but China claims to have ownership over it, meaning that the China would be willing to spend more money and spend more battleships doing all these things. Because if they're ready, if they're ready so okay to lose their perception when they bomb this place and they violate negotiations, obviously they'll spend more money in the military to overpower the US. Thirdly, uh, we already say, and like we already say it, that because of that reason, that means that US citizens themselves wouldn't even want you to spend money on something that you don't even have ownership over. We think China, because they have claimed that they have ownership over it, it wouldn't work. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, we think that under their side, a military presence doesn't do anything because the military presence itself is already Ins insignificant towards China's uh, big uh, incentive to try to overpower that particular military as a whole. So therefore, what is how will your side exacerbate the problem? So how does it affect China? Because they spend a lot of their time saying how China has built all these places in bases and they violate negotiations. Firstly, they say that they attack random boats and fishing boats. Then they build bases and airships in these particular places. They have trade embargoes towards these places. The thing is, we agree that that happens already, but your side makes them makes it happen even worse. I told you in my speech explicitly, and I think I also said it, that because of your side, when you're more paranoid of US being there, when you're more scared, that means that you're going to easily like shoot other people without even realizing. They're going to build even more bases because they are paranoid and they're scared that that, that, that land climbs over them. Meaning that now they'll just strengthen and entrench all the stuff that they have done before, even worse, and therefore you'll harm ASEAN even worse, you harm the US even worse. But then they came up with this weird idea. And the whip said it, but he didn't want to accept a POI. I do not know why. He said that China doesn't follow negotiations. Under your best case scenario, your military presence works. China agrees to give the place to uh, ASEAN. What makes you think under your side, uh, China will follow the negotiations under your side? We think that if China is stubborn, your side still isn't fi fixing the stubborn China as a whole. Lastly, how would this affect ASEAN? I already established already that in the end, when there's more conflicts in that particular area, that means more FDI is deterred from that area. That means in that particular place, uh, maybe like you have even more trade embargoes. Your site and your particular place is used as a proxy war between China and US. We think this is extremely harmful because it harms ASEAN economically as a whole. ASEAN aim is to be an economic bloc, but under your side, they can't be. Because now, a lot of things happen. Their FDI can't come in. They can't have normal trade deals with other people. It's because of your side that ASEAN will have a lot more difficulties trying to fulfill their goal. But lastly, and this was what, and this was dropped by their side, and they didn't respond to it, right? We, they already said that the pillars of ASEAN, where they follow their morality by, where they stand by these few pillars on peace, stability, and harmony, can never be achieved on their side. Because if you want peaceful, stable, harmonious uh, 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 situations in these particular places, in these particular places, the only way your side is, uh, like your side enables these people to do it. Because under your side, your side has war, has war. Your site won't be stable at all because in that particular area, there's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of people dying. There's a lot of fishermen. Can't, they can't fish anymore because there's a lot of fights going on in that particular area. So we think that under our side, we really acknowledge that China is bad. We really acknowledge that the political pressure and the military pressure will never work. So under, on the comparative outside status quo, even in our case scenario, nothing happens. Under your side, China entrenches their views. China will be even worse. Thank you. Opposition is going to lose this debate because their harms are much, much weaker than the harms that we've proven to you on our side. What we needed from them from the very start of this debate was a point of comparison for us to be able to assess whether or not their model is going to be effective because we believe they failed to do such in being able to show that their model is going to win this debate rather than just saying we exacerbate the harm because at least we provide the solution. There are two points we're going to look at. One, 
We're going to look at the stance and the model and how they looked at how different characters thought and how they looked at and played in the debate. And secondly, we're going to look at the worst, worst case comparisons we got from both sides. To the first one, on the stance and the model on how the US will think. They've consistently misrepresented our model as seen in the previous speaker because they've thought that it's a full-scale military invent intervention when it is true. Because we've consistently proven to you that it's not just as simple as that. That we try and make sure that the U.S. can be there as an actor in terms of continental lift to be able to try and defend when the time is needed. Like, for example, we've brought to you examples of the ports in Vietnam or the ports in Philippines wherein they're being built or being at least in close quarters to these places or even in the borders of these countries to prevent a conflict in the South China Sea or these entering these countries in the first place. They responded by saying that, oh, anyways, these things are going to legitimize the acts of China. But we provided to you the problem of why this argument is wrong in the first place, that the fact that in action is already present already means that you are already legitimizing their acts and it already means that you're allowing these conflicts to continue no matter what that if you compare both of the actors or both of the threats in both sides at least we're rather better going to earn the side of caution and say that we're willing to say that we're going to have these ships nearby we're going to have these threats in these places because we believe that the us is a better actor to support we believe that they consistently given value neutral arguments that are irrelevant because many of these things were not mutually exclusive. To get negotiations possible, for example, these things were things that both sides wanted to provide, but they never compared where are the negotiations going to be better. Here's why they had tension in their case, because they believe they only did things that were convenient for their side. They had tension in that argument because they say that the U.S. on one end, will always want to get all of the oil on their side. But even from the whip speaker, we heard that they said that, oh, it's going to be ineffective. The policy will never work. The United States is never going to give enough hope or give enough help because of the simple reason that they don't care enough. He told us that they're only going to send five ships instead of 20 because they don't really care about the region. Yet they're still going to say that they really want to get all this oil. We believe that those contradicting con uh, characterizations cannot say or be there at the same time. But we have to look at the underlying premise that they had on their side. They've proven that it is possible for the United States to be successful in this intervention, or at least in garnering some sort of deterrence from China in these places. So this is the thing we have to look at. What are the mutual exclusive benefits that are only present in our side in a worst case scenario compared to them? We're willing to side with the US, even if they steal from these islands, in the benefit that we get some of the mutual exclusive benefits from our side. We gave you examples, just one, economic trade, because this is a sea route and a trade route that is used by several individuals and several countries in terms of investors, in terms of economic progress. It's not just about politics, it's also about the economy and how they're affected. But two, in terms of the trust, who are you most likely to trust as an ally? And even in the past, we brought you examples that the United States is a better person to trust comparison in comparison to China, that the United States is more susceptible to public scrutiny and more susceptible to concessions in these negotiations compared to China, who has never been susceptible to all these things in the past. So even if we compare the worst, worst case scenario on both sides, we know that they may not have a claim in these places. But the United States is always going to be a better person to be stolen from because they're the country who can better re regulate all these different things or at least be under regulation from the international community in all of these types of the debate. Ladies and gentlemen, for all these and more, we believe the government side is going to win this debate. Thank you. Uh, step outside and they'll call you in with it. This is not a side round, so you will get all adjudication. Oh, I have the question uh... oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>